everybody for participating to this uh, second seminar on the REACH seminar series. So before we start, I'm going to unmute everybody and I will request that during the talk, uh, we all turn off uh, the videos uh, for to facilitate uh, bandwidth and so that everything goes smoothly. Um, and today uh, I'm honored to have uh, as a speaker, uh, Nick Harmon from the University of South Southampton. Uh, he's an observational seismologist and a marine geophysicist. And he started his scientific career uh, in the US. He did a PhD at Brown University uh, working with Don Forsyth, graduating in 2007. And then he was a rich 2000 postdoc uh, fellow at the Scripps, uh, working with uh, Donna Blackman. Then he moved to Southampton, where he's uh, since then, in 2009. And now he's uh, where he's an associate professor. And today he'll be talking about the dynamic lithosphere, sthenosphere boundary. And this is, uh, th these are the results of a PyLab, EuroLab experiment that were led, was led by Catherine Ricker, man, Nick himself, Mike Kendall, and Steve Constable. So Nick, the floor is yours, and I think you have the hand to for the presentation and so on. And I will start recording now. For information, we'll record the talk, we'll post it on the web pages of the REACH seminar series, but we will not be recording uh, the questions and answers. Nick. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, and I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, a long list of collaborators. Um, and I, my wife uh, led this experiment, uh, Catherine Reichert, uh, but then a whole host of uh, students and postdocs uh, really contributed to all the results that I'm going to show you today. And really what I'm going to do is use the oceanic lithosphere to try and understand uh, the lithosphere as the sphere system and talk a little bit about uh, the role of melt and, and how, how that plays into how the lithosphere uh, rides over the asthenosphere to create plate tectonics. Oops, see. Okay. So, and this, these results are from the passive imaging of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. Uh, uh, experiment, PyLab, and then EuroLab, which uh, which is funded by the ERC, and I won't, I can't remember the uh, the acronym for that, so I'll skip over that. Uh, but the whole point was to try and understand uh, plate tectonics, um, and so you know, plate tectonics has been with us for over fifty years now, and 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 we're still kind of grappling with what actually defines the tectonic plate. So classically. It's a rheological definition. So we have a rigid plate that moves coherently over a weaker asthenosphere. Uh, and the weaker asthenosphere is, is the is a, a convecting part. And we typically think of the plate as being the uh, conductively cooling part. And this is kind of the classic definition. And that's been with us pretty much since the beginning. Uh, but understanding what defines that plate in detail has actually eluded us for, for decades now. And, and, and it's important for our understanding for a lot of processes that go on in the earth. It has implications for mantle dynamics, obviously. So how does convection and, and, and conductive cooling working in the mantle, work in the mantle uh, but also going further back in time, understanding how the oceanic lithosphere uh, evolves through time is important for understanding the origin and evolution of continents because a lot of the, the theories for how continents are formed involved oceanic lithosphere in some way, shape or form. And then another thing obviously that we're interested in is understanding the driving forces of plate tectonics and all the knock-on effects that that has in terms of natural disasters such as earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis. And then also if we want to understand the, the the changes in climate and geological time scales, we have to understand what the lithosphere is doing relative to the oceanic lithosphere is doing relative to the continental lithosphere. So how deep the ocean bases are through time are partly dependent on the density structure of the ocean lithosphere, and that's important. Uh, and you have to take that into account when you're trying to understand climate. Okay, so understanding plate tectonics, uh, because most of the Earth's plates are made out of oceanic lithosphere, uh, and the oceanic lithosphere is thought to be relatively simple, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer that this is the place that we should start thinking about it. The only problem is it's covered by a pesky water layer, which makes in-situ measurements quite difficult. Uh, but 
Um, so the classic uh, definition, thermal definition is, is the half space cooling model, which uh, we all know and love, which usually does a pretty good, good job of explaining observations. Uh, you know, at older seafloor ages, uh, people have invoked the plate cooling model, which basically is just an empirical fit to heat flow and um, seafloor subsidence data, uh, but doesn't really have a physical process and physical processes that people kind of invoke to uh, justify the plate models. There must be some sort of constant heat flux, which might be related to small scale convection and other things like that. Uh, but the jury's still out as to why uh, the seafloor seems to flatten and he heat flow seems to flatten at these older seafloor ages. Um, so temperature seems to be doing a lot of what's going on, but we don't, you know, have a full understanding of what's going on. Okay, uh, and then, you know, kind of confirming ideas of thermal prediction. So when we go out and we image uh, the ocean lithosphere, asthenosphere system, uh, so I'm just showing here two different studies. So on, on the right hand side is a global model and you can see there's a uh, fast lid that seems to be thickening with age uh, and a low velocity zone near the ridge. Uh, and then here's some high resolution imaging from my own work at the fast, ultra fast spreading East Pacific rise. And you can see that there's a fast lid, a thickening fast lid, which is more or less jibes with our, our notion of a thermal definition for the lithosphere. However, you may also notice that the velocities there's a low velocity zone off axis here, which kind of gives you a hint that maybe temperature isn't doing everything. Okay, so there are a whole host of other observations besides the one that I just uh, intimated. So there are often uh, observations of a high conductivities beneath mid ocean ridges. So this is a study from uh, Kerry Key, uh, Nine North. Uh, and then this is uh, the classic uh, melt experiment cartoon uh, where there's a very broad uh, melt or inferred melt triangle beneath the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, and then also here's another uh, picture from uh, that I showed previously uh, from uh, Scott French from the, the uh, Berkeley model. Okay, so how do we explain these very low velocities in the mantle? So these two studies chose melt, uh, but uh, there are other, other observations that also suggest that there may be more than just temperature alone. So another uh, indicator that something else is going on besides temperature is that there's a whole host of scattered wave observations. So uh, P waves as they come up and hit a velocity boundary will scatter into an S wave and we can, or an S wave will come up and scatter into a P wave or SS bounces and other, other types of uh, reflected and, and transmitted waves. So if we make a compilation of that, which is what we're showing here as a function of square root of seafloor age and depth, each one of these dots represents an individual uh, study or measurement of one of these converted or, or reflected phases. And you can see in the background, uh, there's the temperature isotherms from a uh, half space cooling and, and uh, plate model. But you can see uh, that for the most part, these scattered wave uh, uh, results are more or less aligning on like the, you know, maybe 1100 degree isotherm, but they're also aligning on uh, these contours here showing you uh, the melt triangle predicted for 125 and 500 ppm water. So at young ages, they seem to align well with that. And then at older ages, it's kind of a hodgepodge uh, of um, depths that we estimate from that at around 60 to 80 kilometers depth. So Scattered waves are interesting because they require sharp velocity gradients, and it's actually very difficult to generate sharp velocity gradients in a thermally defined model. So in order to explain these scattered wave results, we need a velocity model. So here for comparison, these are predictions from Jackson and Fowle, uh, 2010, so shear velocity predictions. And, but this uh, black dashed line is the velocity contrast that you would need to create the SS bounces that we observe across the ocean basins around the world. So <clears throat> these scattered wave phases are telling us, okay, well, temperature is, is, is at least part of the, the problem, but in order to get these phases in the first place, their very existence requires a sharp boundary, which is uh, not consistent with a thermal model alone. So another uh, thing that people have often looked at and wondered about uh, is seismic anisotropy. And so the idea is if you have a, a rigid plate, uh, 
it's cold and you know after it's been deformed it'll uh, it'll olivine will align and, and it will record the anisotropic uh, fast direction that's consistent with the spreading direction but then as the plate ages and moves away from the ridge at greater depths you might have a different uh, anisotropic fabric in the mantle uh, in the asthenosphere because the absolute plate motion or the mantle flow direction may not necessarily be in the same direction as the plate spreading direction for the fossil anisotropy. So, uh, and just, uh, this is, an anisotropy has captured uh, the air science community's imagination for a very long time now. So that, this is a picture uh, from Hess 1964, kind of a classic show, classic diagram showing the two theta dependence of a, of a refraction experiment of, of P wave velocity indicating that there was a fast direction, which was roughly in the direction of uh, plate spreading direction at, in, from the rate at all study. And then this is just a global model showing you uh, predictions for two theta seismic anisotropy from surface waves as a function of depth. And more or less what you see at shallow depths is that the fast directions align with what you would predict for uh, the spreading direction or the fossil spreading direction. And at greater depth, they typically align with absolute plate motion, which is sort of consistent with this view. Okay, but there are other interpretations for anisotropy. So uh, some people uh, have argued that, you know, the, there's a, a depth where you have frozen in anisotropy and then, uh, and then you have another change in direction and the anisotropy may be frozen in and it may not be related to the, uh, the thermal or the real lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary. It may just be uh, an artifact of deformation through of the de an artifact of the deformation history of the plate in the asthenosphere, and it may not have anything to do with the asthenosphere. Um, so, but to kind of explain this, uh, these scattered wave uh, results and and try and bring together a uh, thermal definition and make it self consistent, people have argued for uh, you know the the scattered waves are just seeing anisotropy. People have also argued that. Uh, there is, uh, you know, an oxidation state dependence on the uh, velocity of the mantle, and, and maybe what we're seeing is just that. Uh, other people have argued that elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding may be the actual cause of these uh, sharp velocity contrasts that we observe, and they're sort of related to temperature, but they may not actually reflect the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. Uh, and then other people have argued that low velocity zones might be present. Uh, when you get to near solidus conditions in the asthenosphere. So just before uh, olivine melts, its velocity may drop uh, due to some of these grain boundary effects. Uh, and what I'll try and argue later is that probably these things may be active, but they probably don't explain uh, things as well as melt does. Um, and, but the, the other problem is people have, uh, you know, people often invoke melt to explain low velocities in the asthenosphere. However, uh, many studies have wildly different impressions of what that melt geometry should look like. Uh, so near the ridge, uh, kind of the, the Forsyth at all point of view is that there's just a broad region of melt in, in the asthenosphere uh, directly beneath it. Um, this is a, a recent model from Richard Katz's group, which has a, a more complicated looking melt triangle where you have bl blobs and blebs uh, rising through the asthenosphere and kind of uh, ponding at the base of the lithosphere. Uh, and then there's a, a Tim Stern and, and Mahuchi and Song have uh, from active source studies have seen channels at the base of the lithosphere, which they attributed to melt channels. Uh, and then, um, which is a, a, you know, kind of an old idea of melt ponding from Sparks and Parmentier in 1991. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, people uh, like Hitoshi Kawakatsu have argued that uh, there may be melt in the asthenosphere, but it may be uh, in low amounts in organized bands, and that might be enough to explain the scattered wave results uh, that we see. Uh, so there's a lot of um, kind of uh, debate and discussion in the community about what this actually means. Um, and so another thing that, that is important is actually the spreading rate uh, dependence of the nature of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. So from kind of simple conductive cooling models, so this is work by uh, Jason, Jason Morgan from the 80s, uh, which suggested that if you have a slow spreading system, you would typically have a thicker lithosphere at earlier ages 
uh, just because conduct lateral conductive cooling is important at, at, at low spreading, slow spreading, whereas at fast spreading, we might have something that looks more like the half space cooling model. So you might have a much thinner lithosphere beneath the ridge. Uh, and then also there are predictions for seismic anisotropy. So the behavior of deformation of olivine uh, may be different between fast and, and slow spreading ridges. And, uh, and that's something to also bear in mind. So the, a big problem with a lot of our information to date is that uh, the Pacific has gotten a lot of love in terms of uh, uh, geophysical imaging experiments, in situ geophysical imaging. And so most of our understanding and observation comes from uh, the East Pacific rise uh, or other parts of the Pacific. And there's the Atlantic Ocean is actually relatively sparse. And the Atlantic is, is pretty important for our understanding because a lot of processes uh, that are going on at slow spreading ridges are, are important for our understanding of, the, of how plate tectonics works in general. So the PyLab experiment was designed to rectify this situation. And the idea was to generate a set of ob observations, a complete set of observations over a wide variety of geophysical imaging techniques that would allow us to uh, tease out more information about what was going on. And so this, uh, we deployed 39 ocean bottom seismometers and 39 ocean bottom MT instruments. Uh, we've performed uh, the basic marine geophysics, uh, gravity, magnetics, and swath bathymetry. And uh, Satish and Ingo and uh, Wayne were uh, did a lot of active source work in the region. So, uh, in this one region, in the in the uh, in the equatorial mid Atlantic, we have a, a, a lot of information, an amazing amount of information, and that's what we'll focus on today. Uh, these are just some nice cruise pictures. This is showing you the station map. So this is the Romance fracture zone. This is the chain fracture zone, and then the ridge is going through here. And so the total uh, age that we cover uh, because of this uh, long offset Romance fracture zone. So we go from about uh, zero to 40 million uh, south of the Romance, but then as we step over the Romance, we go up to about 80 million year old seafloor. So we have a pretty good sampling of the uh, Atlantic seafloor in this, in this one region. Okay, so on to uh, some of the results from the experiment and, and what did we learn? So this is just to show you that we have pretty good data. So this is, a, a, I'm showing you uh, earthquake distribution for a surface wave study and I'm a surface wave guy. So obviously that comes first. Uh, so uh, this is just showing you an example of a nice earthquake uh, recorded on uh, Christmas day in 2016 in Chile, Merry Christmas. Uh, and then uh, this is just showing you the rate path coverage for 18 through 143 seconds. Um, this is just showing you a 1D dispersion curve uh, and, a, and the corresponding shear velocity model uh, from Rayleigh waves. And you know, on average, we have about a 50 kilometer thick uh, fast lid and a low velocity zone in the region, which is what we kind of expect for oceanic lithosphere. Um, and then these are the phase velocity maps, and, and these are, are difficult to interpret uh, just by looking at them. But in general, we see at short periods, we see low velocity zones near the mid-ocean ridge, which is expected, and then higher velocities further off axis. And then when we get to 100 seconds, uh, it becomes a little bit more modeled. Okay. Um, so... And then there are a few other kind of notable anomalies. This region here always appears to be fast, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we look at the uh, shear velocity model. So what I'm showing here uh, is the shear velocity model. So this is uh, VS. Uh, the contours are uh, in kilometers per second, so 4.5 kilometers per second, 4.6 kilometers per second. Uh, and again, so at 26 kilometers depth, which is just about uh, the middle of the lithosphere for the, for the most part, uh, we see a low velocity region uh, near the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, and as we go across the chain fracture zone here, we see another low velocity at the end of the ridge segment. And then we see low velocities in the mantle getting down to around four kilometers per second, uh, which is pretty slow, which probably indicates that there's uh, some, some uh, low velocities below 4.15 kilometers per second are probably related to the presence of partial melt in, in the Essene sphere. But then if we look in transect view, uh, we see, so the mid-ocean ridge is here. So we see a low velocity region directly beneath the ridge and a, a low velocity anomaly is a little bit asymmetric. And then we have a, a fairly asymmetric low velocity zone going off to the right. 
interestingly, so uh, we're at the equator. So every degree of longitude is about 111 uh, kilometers. So about 300 kilometers off axis, uh, we have uh, one of the strongest low velocity zones in the region, which was surprising to us. And then we have this high velocity zone going down into the mantle, which we interpreted as being a, a drip off into the mantle. Uh, and then uh, the line two, which is down here across the southern ridge segment, but south of chain, we see another low velocity zone. And again, uh, you know, relatively close to the mid ocean ridge. Uh, but then again, further off axis, three to 400 kilometers off axis, we also observe another uh, pretty significant low velocity zone. So what this suggested to us was that this is a, a relatively complicated pattern of uh, upwelling uh, beneath the mid-ocean ridge. Obviously, we have uh, mid-ocean ridge circulation, uh, but we, are, we also have uh, what looks to be upwelling, downwelling further off axis, which we interpreted to be a small scale convection. This is just showing you recovery tests, just to give you some confidence that uh, what, we, what we did with the surface wave imaging was fairly robust. And you can see in general, you know, we recovered checkers pretty well. And this is a synthetic structure for the mid-ocean ridge and we were able to recover that pretty well. Okay, uh, this is just a, a quick show and tell about the seismicity in the region. We recorded uh, several thousand events uh, along the chain and along the Romanche. Um, and uh, if you get the chance, Steve Hicks had a really nice paper about um, uh, a super shear uh, at magnitude 7.1, which is this giant one uh, on the Romanche, uh, which was pretty neat and unexpected. Uh, so, but we're uh, in the process of, of writing up the seismicity for the region. And we've also done uh, body wave tomography using the local seismicity. And again, we get a similar pattern to what we observed in the surface wave anomalies. So we see a low velocity zone uh, beneath the mid-ocean ridge. Um, in the south, the, the low velocity anomaly is a, a lot more muted than compared to the north. Uh, which is similar to what we saw in the surface wave imaging. Okay, and isotropy again is another interesting aspect about trying to understand what's going on in, in terms of the deformation of the fossil that's fossilized in the lithosphere versus the ongoing deformation in the asthenosphere. Uh, so we we can measure uh, two theta peak to peak anisotropy from Rayleigh waves. So the white dots here are just showing you the result from ambient noise. Uh, cross-correlation, and then through here, the red uh, squares are showing you the two theta measurements from teleseismic data. Uh, and what we observe is that we have relatively strong anisotropy at short periods, but then as we get to the longer periods, uh, the anisotropy is relatively weak, so about 1%, 1 to 2%. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the anisotropy, so the direction of these little bars indicates the azimuth of the uh, fast direction. And in this case, for the most part, the azimuth of the fast direction appears to be in the uh, somewhere between absolute plate motion for the African plate and the spreading direction, which is about 80 degrees, uh, which was interesting. Uh, we were also able to uh, do uh, tomography uh, lateral, uh, so to look at the lateral variation in the two theta anisotropy. Um, and what we observed uh, from uh, Rayleigh wave group velocities is that near the ridge, we had uh, sub-parallel to the ridge axis fast directions. And then as we moved further off axis, we get uh, spreading direction um, in isotropy. And this is pretty interesting uh, in the sense that we go from a region uh, that doesn't really have very strong anisotropy in the, in the spreading or APM direction uh, and this may be consistent with vertical upwelling, uh, which is, was uh, hypothesized years ago. Uh, but then uh, eventually uh, strain of olivine kicks in uh, and then we develop a, a, a reasonably strong fabric uh, kind of on the order of one to 3% uh, anisotropy in, with a fast direction, spreading direction, uh, which, we, which we, were quite, we thought was quite exciting. Um, and we can also compare our results from uh, surface wave and isotropy to SKS splitting. So on the right hand side is the SK splitting uh, data set. Uh, these are stacks of the SKS splitting. And what we see near the ridge is we actually have quite strong uh, anisotropy. So this is about three seconds of uh, splitting in the SKS. 
uh, you know, within 50 to 100 kilometers of the ridge here, and we have similar observation of the southern ridge. But then as we get further and further away from the ridge, the fast direction uh, of the SKS splitting rotates into uh, the spreading or, or absolute plate motion direction for the most part. There's a few uh, odd, odd examples here and there. Uh, but again, so this suggests, uh, you know, the NSHB here is about half a second to one second, which is significantly weaker than what was observed at the, east, the ultra fast spreading East Pacific rise. So that suggests that something about the NSHB structure with depth is different here. We can also look at uh, local splitting. So these are the local splitting results. So these are from the earthquakes that were along the chain fracture zone here. And again, we see a, a, an interesting pattern, uh, which mirrors what we saw in the SKS and also the surface wave results is that near the ridge, we have uh, ridge parallel to ridge subparallel uh, fast directions. Uh, and these are, these are relatively small. So these are like half a second to a few tenths of a second splitting. Uh, but then as we get further away from the spreading ridge, uh, this fast direction starts to rotate around uh, and, and points in the spreading direction by the time it's gotten to about 15 to 20 million years. Um, so, and if you, if you go through and do the calculation of, of what's the, what would be the uh, effective viscosity of the asthenus, uh, sorry, of the, of the lithospheric mantle here, uh, you get a, a viscosity. Uh, so, if, and assuming that you need a strain of about five, uh, to get a to get a well developed olivine fabric in in the spreading direction, so going from here to about here is, is about 12, 12 million years. And so if you go through and do the calculation, you get a you get a a, a viscosity of about ten to the twenty uh, pascal seconds, which uh, is is roughly consistent with with some of the rheological experiments that people do on olivine, which was also pretty interesting to us. Okay. So just to kind of drive home the, the differences here. So on the left-hand side, we have two theta peak-to-peak -peak anisotropy from Rayleigh waves uh, from the Atlantic. And on the right-hand side, we have peak-to-peak -peak anisotropy uh, from the ultra-fast spreading EPR. And so in the same period range, the, uh, the magnitude of anisotropy uh, at the specific rise is, is significantly faster. It's definitely outside of air. So, you know, our air bar goes up to about two and a half to three uh, uh, percent anisotropy, whereas in the Pacific, it's well above three, three to five percent in the same period range. So something is definitely different between these two, whether or not it's the, the strength of anisotropy within the lithosphere slash asthenosphere itself, or if it's actually just the thickness of the well-organized layer of anisotropy between the two is, is uh, a subject of, of further work, I think. Okay, the other interesting thing of our, uh, from our observations of anisotropy is, is uh, uh, some previous work looking at the predicted relative strength of anisotropy between uh, a fast spreading and a, and a slow spreading center actually predicts the opposite of what we see. So for fast spreading, uh, so this is Blackman and Kendall, uh, you know, the SKS splitting is predicted to, to be about, you know, less than one second uh, when, the, when the spreading is going full force, whereas the uh, splitting predicted from slow spreading is actually predicted to be higher. So that implies that, you know, th this is, uh, you know, this is cutting edge stuff. Uh, Don has done a lot of work to, to improve these types of models, but it suggests that maybe there is some physics missing from these calculations. So it, it, these results should help uh, drive uh, more work in this direction to kind of understand and explain these results. Okay. Uh, so another thing, if we want to look at scattered wave imaging uh, in, in our region, uh, and we want to understand if there is indeed actually a sharp uh, 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 S to P conversion from the base of a, of, a, of a not thermally defined plate, we have to do a whole bunch of corrections to understand what the shallow structure is before we can get at that. So one of the first things we did was to look at uh, the sediments in the region. And so one way you can look at that is um, because the sediments are, are very slow relative to the crust, they actually cause um, 
P waves and S waves to go nearly vertical. So it, it polarizes your seismograms almost perfectly. So um, on the vertical component, you expect to see the P wave motion going up and down. Uh, but then uh, the S wave on the on the radio component, but after it's been converted at this strong boundary, uh, should should be a perfect copy of the P wave, but should arrive uh, a few tenths of a second to a few seconds later, uh, because the shear velocity in the sediment is it can be you know very slow. It can be on the order of hundreds of meters uh, per second, which is quite slow. Uh, and so these plots here are just showing you. So in black is the vertical component of the seismogram, and red is the radial component of the seismogram and blue is the, is the tangential component. And what you can see is that the vertical component always arrives slightly earlier than the uh, radial component. So what we're looking at is, is the P wave coming in in black and the S wave coming in in red. Um, and so we can use these little delay times and the relative amplitude between these phases uh, to model the sediment properties. Uh, and then we can use that information to correct out uh, the contribution for the for the sediment, and in some cases that sediment can be, you know, a second delay time. Which, if you were trying to map that into mantle anomaly structure, uh, would, would would be a bit of a disaster um, <clears throat> for tomography and, and, and other things. Okay, so this is just showing you uh, uh, the collection of the sediment thickness uh, from these observations, and you can see here this is the global sediment thickness in the background, and then these. Uh, these symbols are colored uh, sediment thickness and you can see to first order we're doing you know the global model is not doing such a bad job uh, and then uh, we can look uh, we can look at the p to s delay as a function of seafloor age and we thought we saw a kink in the trend here so at relatively young seafloor ages uh, we have a pretty uh, healthy uh, five millimeters uh, per thousand year uh, sedimentation rate but then after about eight or nine million years, that sedimentation rate seems to decrease dramatically. And we thought, uh, or we argued in, in this particular paper that you know, we might be seeing the onset of the, of the monsoons at about eight to nine million years here. And that, that could explain why we have a difference in the sedimentation rate uh, with more contribution from Africa. Okay, so then going back to the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary and trying to understand that through scattered phases. So, uh, we use S to P receiver functions to, to image the oceanic uh, lithosphere, seasphere boundary. Uh, we apply a whole bunch of corrections to it. Uh, like I said, uh, tilting appliance sediment uh, corrections. And then we use a, a, an extended time multi-taper deconvolution uh, to highlight phases that were converted from either the MOHO or the lithosphere, seasphere boundary or deeper. And we were pretty lucky. We have uh, a pretty high number of events that we could use. Uh, and this is just this diagram is just to show you that we have an S wave coming in. It's converted uh, at the lithosphere, stenosphere boundary to a P wave and comes into the station. And so these phases arrive before the main S phase. And so we calculate our receiver functions based on that. And so uh, we think we can see a pretty reasonable moho. Obviously, we don't have super high resolution because uh, S waves have relatively uh, long, uh, long period uh, dominant periods. Uh, like around 10 seconds, uh, but you can see we have a, a spatial pattern of relatively thin crust in the northern segment uh, that changes through time, which might be similar to what we observed in the residual mantle bouguet anomaly, which suggests that there are changes in crustal thickness uh, as a function of time on the ridge. Which we, um, and then going deeper into the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. So this is a, a cross section. So what you're looking at here, so blue is a velocity decrease with depth uh, and red is a velocity increase with depth. So red here is the moho. And then here we think is the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. So the bottom of the fast lid. And so what we're plotting here in the background, so the colors are, are the receiver function amplitudes. Uh, that have been migrated to depth. But then these contours here are showing you uh, the velocity contours from the surface wave model that I showed earlier. And so you can see above our low velocity anomaly that was about 300 kilometers off axis, we actually get a little uh, detection of a scattered phase uh, just above that, uh, indicating that there probably is uh, that low velocity zone is, is pretty robust. And then similarly, on the, on the, on the western side here, we see a lithosphere uh, that 
gradually thickens with age. And you, you can see that it, it agrees pretty well. This is the uh, 4.35 uh, kilometer per second uh, contour, which it seems to do a pretty good job of tracking both on this side and on that side when there's a low velocity zone present. So this is our, our best image. And that's if we look at it in, in map view in general, on the Western side, we see a uh, thin, uh, thin lithosphere about 20 kilometers thick that increases to uh, around 60 to uh, 70 kilometers thick further off axis, which is uh, kind of jibes with what we showed earlier in the scattered phases, uh, showing that the, the lithosphere does appear to thicken with age, but it does have a sharp boundary in some places. Okay, and then this is a profile from the, the middle segment, which is a bit more complicated. Uh, if, it were, if it were beautiful everywhere, you'd probably be suspicious. Uh, so lithosphere asthenosphere boundary is here, but it's also, again, uh, the lithosphere asthenosphere uh, boundary is quite strong over the regions where we have these low velocity anomalies, uh, suggesting that they are robust features. Okay, we can also use scattered phases to look deeper. Uh, and so we, we looked at P to S conversions uh, to look at the mantle transition zone. And so typically people think that uh, upwelling from the transition zone uh, only really occurs at hot spots and then there's downwelling at subduction zones. And, and, and we typically don't think that uh, ridges uh, have a strong upwelling from the lower mantle. Uh, that's what we thought anyways. But then uh, when we looked at the P to S conversions, uh, so this is just showing you uh, a transect across that central segment there. Um, what you can see is that actually, so this is the 410 uh, discontinuity uh, imaged here, and this is the 660. And so what you can see is just to the west of the mid-Atlantic ridge here, the uh, 410 seems to dip down a little bit and the 660 seems to, to shallow, uh, get a little bit shallower. And that's typically a structure that we would associate with uh, a high temperature mantle plume uh, would tend to drive those two boundaries together. So, but we're not at a, you know, there's no evidence for uh, a mantle plume upwelling in this particular area. Uh, so in our mind, it suggested that there might be uh, upwelling uh, from the mantle transition zone uh, in, beneath the mid-ocean ridge segment beneath the mid-ocean mid -ocean ridge segment in this area. And so this is just showing uh, what I showed you in the profile. This is showing you a map view. So we have uh, a, a deepened 410 and a shallow 660, which produces a thinner uh, tra mantle transition zone in general, which suggests that there's hot material transiting through the transition zone here. And we asked ourselves, OK, well, maybe this is just a weird local feature. Uh, but then if you look at uh, a map of the of the average transition zone uh, velocity structure. Uh, and this is from a particular model. So this is from the Princeton Group's uh, finite frequency body wave tomography. So the Montelli et al. paper 2005. Uh, you know, you can see there there is a pretty strong correlation with low velocities beneath the mid-Atlantic ridge system in this particular area. Uh, and so the, the next question we asked ourselves, okay, well, that's in the, just in, in one model, but do we see it in other global models uh, for the Mid-Atlantic Ridge? Um, and so we tested a whole bunch of them. So this is S40 RTS, which is uh, from, from Michigan, uh, Ritzema uh, and S Globe and Size Globe and the Berkeley Group and, and a whole bunch of other uh, models. And almost every single model has a similar uh, trend. So this is the, the velocity anomaly, this is a histogram of the velocity anomaly plotted as a function of uh, distance from the ridge uh, rather than seafloor age. And so this is PRI and you can see the, uh, these uh, cyan circles are the average or median average of the, of the histogram in, in each bin. And you can see there's a pretty clear increase in velocity away from the ridge. Uh, but then almost every single model has that pattern uh, uh, to some degree, would suggest that at least in the mid-Atlantic, that upwelling uh, from the mantle transition zone uh, is, is highly likely. Uh, and if that's the case, then this may actually be one of the drivers for the mid-Atlantic ridge itself. So the, you know, the upwelling from the transition zone, the deep upwelling, may actually be what's driving and sustaining 
the mid ocean ridge in the Atlantic. You know, the mid Atlantic has always been a funny one because there's no clear driving force. It's not like the Pacific where there's tons of slabs around that, that, that are pulling the plates apart. So this may explain that. Okay, and the upwelling from the West may also explain why we seem to have, uh, you know, kind of a Western uh, asymmetry to our observations beneath the ridge. Okay. So now coming to the magnetotellurics, which was another uh, very important part of our study. Um, so uh, this is just showing you uh, the, uh, in the background colors is the uh, log resistivity in ohm meters. So low resistivity uh, is typically associated with uh, things like uh, melt, which uh, when it's interconnected uh, allows, uh, acts like a good uh, uh, conductor of electricity. And again, we see a very similar pattern. So what I, we've plotted here is the, uh, and I, is the uh, surface wave model again, and you can see where the resistivity has uh, low resistivity, we also have low seismic velocities, which, which suggests that these are probably regions where uh, there is melt. Uh, and then the interesting thing from uh, the southern profile, the profile south of the chain, is that instead of having these large uh, anomalies, you know, broad anomalies at depth, there seem to be these uh, channel, channelized uh, high, conduct, high conductivity, low resistivity regions just at the base of the tectonic plate, which is consistent with the Mohuchi and Song result uh, just to the north, suggesting that uh, you know, within the same study region, we actually have two different forms of melt. So we have melt in a broad zone of upwelling, and then we also have channelized melt at the base of the lithosphere, uh, which, is, which is pretty interesting because it, it suggests that melt is not just a static, you know, it hangs out in the melt triangle uh, uh, thing, it may actually, as it percolates up through the asthenosphere, it may actually coalesce at the base of the lithospheric plate. This is just to show you uh, the robustness. Uh, so these are input and output tests for uh, the magnetotellurics. These are just showing you if we reduce or perturb these different anomalies, uh, what happens to the fit to the data. And in general, it seems like if you get rid of these anomalies, you get a much worse fit, uh, particularly for certain stations. So the, the best fit is the black line, the perturbed model is the red line, suggesting that uh, you're doing a worse job fitting the data when you change those. So trying to bring all these things together. So what's plotted on here, these purple lines are the receiver function results. Again, uh, the contours are the surface wave results and the colors are the uh, resistivity MT results. So these channels uh, are uh, tricky to image with uh, receiver functions because you can have, um, uh, if you have a positive, if you have a velocity decrease with depth and then velocity increase with depth, the conversions from both the top and the bottom for long period waveforms tend to cancel each other out. So it makes them hard, hard to image. Uh, so in the regions where we are able to image, uh, so for example, in uh, region D here, where we think we have a channel, a low velocity anomaly, and we also have a receiver function, we think that the channel is probably wide enough for uh, all three me methods to effectively see it. Uh, whereas in other places where the channel is quite thin, uh, the receiver functions have trouble imaging it uh, through here because it's too thin. Uh, so, and we are working on generating uh, surface wave results that can be also consistent with the uh, magnetotellurics. So that's future work for us. But again, these are just showing you uh, 1D comparisons that, and, and in general where we have, uh, you know, the thickness of the fast lid from the surface waves is generally thickness, is generally consistent with the thickness of the high resistivity lid of the uh, magnetotellurics studies. And, and generally we can see a, uh, an LAB or a converted phase uh, in, in, the, in the region where there's a gradient in the surface waves and the MT. Okay, and the other neat thing uh, is uh, uh, from Satish's group, they also seem to have a, a, a reflector at about this depth uh, where we have our S to P result, which is also quite exciting. Okay, <clears throat> so just to bring it all together a little bit. So, uh, you know, 
it's been uh, a long time since uh, you know a, a lot of work has been done in terms of uh, numerical modeling of ridges. Uh, so again, so going back to uh, the Phipps Morgan study from from the, the late '80s, there, um, you know, and I think the ridge community has probably known this, but you know, there there is actually thick lithosphere beneath uh, uh, slow spreading centers, and we image that both in the surface waves, and we image that also in the resistivity structure and also in the receiver functions, uh, which is quite interesting. And that does suggest that lateral conductive cooling is really important at these slow spreading, sp slow spreading rates. Um, and then if we put our results in with the global uh, kind of compilation of scattered phases, uh, we see that you know, our results are generally in line with that. So compared to the half space cooling model, uh, very few studies. So this one of these is from Cascadia. One of the some of these diamonds are from our study. Uh, and then so, you know, when we have intermediate to slow spreading, we seem to have conversions that are at, you know, 20, uh, 20 to 25 kilometers depth, which again is consistent with this. Uh, but then we also see an increase in thickness uh, with the lithosphere, which is generally consistent with the thermal model, but we obviously need something more uh, like partial melt in, in the asthenosphere to explain that. Okay, so that's that. And then, um, so the other interesting thing that came out of our result is that the temperature plays an important role, but also small scale convection seems to be also very important, especially at slow spreading. So in our case, we observe both a lithospheric drip at about uh, 30 million years, but then we also see upwelling, not just beneath the ridge, but also uh, pretty far off axis, which suggests that we do have a, a pretty healthy convective system. And we, we observe this in, in uh, both, both ridge segments. So there's a lot more going on uh, beneath the oceans than we previous, previously thought. We, we hypothesized it, but you know, we, we definitely have, have imaged this, this uh, exciting complication in some ways. Um, and so in comparison to these specific rise where uh, people have hypothesized about uh, Richter roles and well-organized uh, convective cells that generate uh, you know, gravity lineations and things like that. Uh, the slow spreading uh, systems may actually have a more chaotic small scale convective system uh, where you know, it's a bit more random. The, the upwellings and downwellings aren't as well organized as they are in the Pacific. Uh, the other, uh, interesting thing about this is if you have this convective upwelling and downwelling, you might expect this to disrupt the asthenospheric flow regime, and this would have the knock-on effect of weakening the anisotropy. And this may be the explanation of why we, we don't have a strong anisotropy as, we, as is observed in the Pacific, where the flow is so fast, the, the spreading rate is so fast that it may just drive the flow. Okay, and then the other interesting thing is that while people have, uh, so this is just an example from uh, the Nafedal study where they've argued that there's a melt channel at the base of uh, the plate going into, into Costa Rica, uh, sorry, Nicaragua rather, and then Mahuchi and Song and Stern have also argued for uh, a channel at the base of the plate uh, in, in just north of our study region and, and, and going into uh, New Zealand. Uh, we also observe that. So this, this is a, a, a robust feature, we think, but it, it is also uh, ephemeral, right? So it's, it, we observe it in some places in our study area, but we, and we don't observe it in other places. So it suggests that melt is, is, is dynamic and, and, and flexing through the system uh, and that these channels, their thickness, uh, you know, because we can image something with S to P in some places and not others, but the MT seems to see thinning and thickening channels seems to suggest that these channels may also uh, get thicker or thinner through time. So going back to uh, our, our discussion of what, what can explain everything, well, uh, so the subsolidus po possibilities uh, probably don't explain all of our observations, so we're probably left with melt. Uh, so this is exciting, but it also suggests that we have a bit more work to do in our understanding of things because we need to uh, go a little bit further and, and try to uh, understand and incorporate the effects of melt migration into our models of plate tectonics and our understanding of how plate tectonics works. So this is just a, a nice model from uh, Joyce Sim uh, showing porosity waves 
uh, in the Mid Ocean Ridge. And uh, some work that we're doing, future work that we're doing, is to try and, and model these and understand what the geophysical uh, images would look like and how we can go from one to the other. Uh, and then uh, just to kind of conclude, um, you know, we think this is a cartoon of what we think is going on. So we have ascending melt from upwelling regions. It coalesces at the base of the plate and it may channel and focus itself to the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, and because melt would necessarily weaken the asthenosphere, that may be what causes the rheological difference between uh, the plate and the asthenosphere below. And this is just showing you uh, images of what it looks like in different settings of what people have reported in, for melt in different settings. Um, so we have a lot of uh, variability in melt uh, going forward. So this is uh, just before my conclusion slide here. So this is just to show you, uh, and this is uh, a courtesy of, of uh, Hitoshi uh, Kawakatsu and, and Akiko Takeo. So this is the image of seismic images, uh, imaging experiments in the, in the Pacific. And this is the image of the seismic experiments that have been done in the Atlantic. And you can see there's a big disparity between another number of black triangles between here and there. So I think, uh, you know, just as an advertisement, I think, uh, you know, international collaboration is key uh, for, for settling this discrepancy. Uh, and maybe we should set up Atlantic Array to um, follow on from Pacific Array. Okay, so I think I've said most of these conclusions. So I'll, I'll stop my talk there for the purposes of time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Here.